something just is not right. I mean, she would not, she would not run off. It's been five weeks since we've seen her face. It's been five weeks since we've seen her smile. The families of two young women connected by tragedy by a murder case that's made national headlines. No one has seen or heard from Jessica Runyon in days. As a community is torn apart, <laughs> the man charged with the girl's deaths is about to go on trial. What happened to your face? Did you get burned? What happened to your face? Did you kill Jessica? Did you? As concerns are raised about the credibility of the case. Just because we don't respond to something doesn't mean we didn't do it. I'm waiting until we get resolution and justice for both of our girls. Thank you for joining us. I'm Caitlin Knute. It took a decade for a Kansas City area family to get answers about what happened to their daughter, Cara Kopetsky, after she walked out of her high school, never to be seen again. During that time, another young woman disappeared. Jessica Runyon's vanished after leaving a house party. Prosecutors allege the same man is responsible, but uncovering the truth won't be easy. Kara Kopetsky, all smiles in this home video. A typical teenager who enjoyed music, her friends, and looked forward to her senior year of high school. Jessica Runyon's, idolized by her sisters, an aspiring writer with a beautiful smile and laugh. But the two girls and their families would soon be linked by unimaginable acts of violence. The morning of May 4th, 2007, a school security camera captured Kara Kopetsky leaving Belton High School. It would be the last time the 17-year-old would be seen alive. Kara worked at this Popeyes, but didn't show up. Calls and texts to her cell phone went unanswered. Fearing for Kara's safety, that same day a friend of hers went to Belton Police. And after police talked with Kara's family that night, she was reported as missing. One week after she vanished, 41 Action News was invited inside the family's home. You know, her dresser is full. In Kara's bedroom, none of her clothes were missing. Her iPod and phone charger left on a table. Something just is not right. I mean, she would not, she would not run off. I, I know she's my daughter, and I know in my heart she would not do that. Her cell phone and debit card unused. She's not used or accessed her phone since the day of May 4th, uh, and that's unusual for anybody with a cell phone, let alone a teenage girl. But despite flyers posted around the community and the publicity surrounding the case, days turned into months. If you have any information on this case, please call the Belton Police Department. And there was no sign of Kara. I just get up every morning and I ask God to help me make it through another day and I ask God, hopefully today will be the day that that call comes in that leads to where Kara is. Tips were coming in, but still no word. There's just a lot of pain and hurt in our family. You know, it's a struggle every day. Happy birthday to you. Kara's family gathered for her 18th birthday. What's changed? Nothing. I mean, I haven't even done her laundry. One year later, her bedroom remained untouched. I'm her mom. She's my daughter, and I'm not giving up until I know what happened and where she's at. Over the years, the prayers and searches continued, but... <coughs> Despite the community interest in the case, hope began to fade. Having a missing child, especially for nine years, it's the most frustrating thing that a person can go through. She's a sweet girl, and we, we miss her. And I don't know, just, it don't seem right. It don't seem right. Right now, police are looking for a missing woman they say may be in danger. September 2016, 21-year-old Jessica Runyons disappeared after leaving a house party and was reported missing. Two days later, her SUV was found torched near 95th and Blue River Road in Kansas City. Her family distraught. She's loving, caring. I mean, she helped raise her sisters. Um, she's strong, independent, and we just want her to come home safe. But in April 2017, seven months after Jessica vanished, shocking news, a mushroom hunter came upon human remains on wooded property in rural Cass County. Now a crime scene, searchers located a second set of remains in that same area. I can say that we did identify uh, several pieces of evidence. The first set of remains were quickly identified as Jessica Runyon's. 
The Kapetsky family worried the other bones belonged to Kara. Months later, their fears were confirmed. Well, it's been a long 10 years, and we don't like to use the word closure. We prefer the word resolution. And of course, now we are headed into a new phase. You know, um, we've gotten car identified, and now we can have a funeral and put her to rest. We got her back. After everything is said and done is, is when she'll get peace. Once she gets justice, both her and Kara, I mean, that's when they're going to get peace. But that peace would prove to be a long time coming for Kara, Jessica, and their families. As the investigation expands into what happened to the women, attention turns to a name already known to law enforcement. Did you kill Jessica? Did you? Kyler used close connections to both Kara and Jessica. Kara Kapetsky and Jessica Runyon's two vibrant young women killed nearly a decade apart. Years after Kara's death and within hours of Jessica's disappearance, a name emerges. Someone friends say they saw Jessica with leaving a house party. That person, well known to Kara's family and to police. Hey Jess, um, it's hard to write this letter, but I'm gonna start with, I am really happy that you were found. I miss you so much. Within hours of Jessica Runyon's disappearance and nine years after anyone last heard from Kara Kapetsky, the two missing person cases would become linked. Friends of Jessica's told police they saw her leave a house party with a man named Kyler Eust. Eust was also Kara Kapetsky's ex-boyfriend and a person of interest in her 2007 disappearance. Belton police focused on 18-year-old Eust because, days before Kara disappeared, she filed a protection order against him. In it, violent accusations in her own handwriting, including that Eust kidnapped, restrained, one month ago choked her, and with a knife in his hand, threatened to slit her throat. I am unsure of what he will do next because the abuse has gotten worse over time. He's all about control, and he wanted control over Kara. Belton police questioned Kyler about his contact with Kara the morning she disappeared. Court documents show he told police he did not have any contact with Kara that day. But phone records revealed a different story, that Kara called Kyler at 9.13 that morning and he returned her call at 9.20, one minute before she's seen on surveillance video leaving the school. However, Belton police said that Kyler had an alibi and wasn't in that city the day Kara disappeared. Instead, he was reportedly visiting a great aunt at a Kansas City nursing home. Police also said he passed a lie detector. The cops have yeah, said you've been very cooperative. Mm -hmm. I have been because I don't have anything, I don't know anything about where she is or about what happened. I wish I did. Did you threaten all. to slit her throat? No. <laughs> didn't. What, what happened? That didn't happen that night. That was before. Although reminders of Kara's disappearance can be found throughout the community, years would go by with no clues as to what happened to her. We still have not received the lead or the information that we need. Trouble, though, seemed to follow Kyler Eust, including drug charges and an arrest for felony stealing in 2011. That same year, he pleaded guilty to assaulting a pregnant girlfriend, a second woman to allege he was physically abusive. According to an order of protection filed, she claimed Eust choked, slapped, and punched her, drew a pentagram on her forehead, and threatened to kill her, her family, and her baby. You pled guilty. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what happened in the Kara Kapetsky case? I didn't know there was a case. In 2012, Kyler was handed a 45-month sentence on drug charges. In 2016, he was released from federal prison. A violation of his parole, though, quickly followed, and he was ordered to spend a September weekend in prison. But just days before that was to happen, Jessica Runyon's disappeared after leaving a house party. Kyler was friends with Jessica's then-boyfriend, who had left the party early. Witnesses told police they saw Jessica leave in her SUV with Kyler. Two days later, Jessica's SUV was found burned in Kansas City with no signs of Jessica. She has a great sense of humor and a wonderful smile. We all love her very much. We miss her. And there's probably not one person in this family that can say anything bad about her. That same day, court documents state Kyler Eust's half-brother, Jessup Carter, contacted Belton police. He alleged he was with Kyler and that his half-brother, quote, told him that he strangled and killed Jessica and that she was gone and that Kyler dragged the victim's body into an undisclosed wooded area. 
Jessup also claimed he was with Kyler when he set Jessica's SUV on fire. Jessup said he and Kyler then drove to Jessup's trailer, 100 miles away in Edwards, Missouri, where one day later, police took Kyler into custody. A warrant 41 Action News obtained shows police collected bullets and clothing, fingernail scrapings, and swabbed Kyler's face and hands. In his Benton County mugshot, ointment for what police confirmed were scratches and burns. Kyler Eust was then extradited to Jackson County. Kyler, where's Jessica? I have no idea, sir. What happened to your face? Did you get burned? What happened to your face? Did you kill Jessica? Did you? No answer? At the time, Kara's mom hoped that arrest would finally bring them answers. Now that he's in custody, hopefully they're interviewing him and getting him to give up and fi find out where Jessica is and possibly even get some more information about Kara. But weeks later, still no word. It's been five weeks since we've seen her face. It's been five weeks since we've seen her smile. Um, it's been five weeks since she's played with her sisters and laugh. We're just begging people to look on your land. If you've got land that you never farm and you just have it sitting there, look at it. Or if you don't want to or can't, call us. We will definitely come out and look. Then in April 2017, finally some news. Breaking tonight at 10 o'clock, search crews rushing to a Cass County area after a mushroom hunter finds the unthinkable. A mushroom hunter came across a skull and set of bones in a wooded area south of Belton. A search revealed a second set of remains nearby. The area, just a few miles from a home where Eust would hang out with friends. I just feel bad for the mother that we didn't know all those years that the daughter was just right there. In April 2017, one set of remains was identified as Jessica Runyon's. Four months later, the second set of remains was identified as Kara Kopetsky. In October, Cass County prosecutors charged Eust with two counts of first degree murder and two counts of abandonment of a corpse. He pleaded not guilty. Although the families finally had some answers, many questions remained. And little did they know at the time, it would take several more years before Kyler Eust would go on trial. Coming up. Now I'm not okay and my family's not okay with anything that he did. A key witness in the case is found dead and the credibility of the case is questioned. We are doing our best working with the information we have to work with in clearing this case. As the defense team tries to poke holes in the investigation. back to Journey for Justice, the trial of Kyler Eust. In 2017, Kyler Eust was behind bars, charged with killing Kara Kopetsky and Jessica Runyons. But it would be several more years before anyone would take the stand in Cass County, a source of frustration for both families. Meanwhile, Kyler's attorneys argue that during all this time, there were several other suspects who went ignored. As Kara Kopetsky's case evolved, her family's frustration grew. It just solidifies what I had already suspected. Which is what? Which is that they're not doing their job. They're not trying to find Kara. They questioned why it took a month for police to release security video from Belton High School the day Kara disappeared. And it wasn't until that summer that anyone opened Kara's locker, and it wasn't the police. The janitor did, and he said, if you don't come pick these up, we're going to throw them away. Kara's debit card and backpack were found inside. Citizens eventually circulated a petition demanding the state step in and take the case away from Belton Police. Then Missouri Governor Matt Blunt responded. I think I mentioned the Highway Patrol and other state resources that we've made available to local responders. Just because we don't respond to something doesn't mean we didn't do it. Uh, we are doing our best. Uh, working with the information we have to work with in clearing this case. Belton police maintained they were following every lead. But in court documents, Kyler Eust's defense team alleges that wasn't the case, saying authorities quickly focused only on their client. In a motion to dismiss charges in the case, his attorneys alleged, among other things, that investigators failed to validate Kyler's alibi, in which he said he was with his grandparents visiting a great aunt at a nursing home. His attorneys claimed police only interviewed Kyler's grandfather, Al Eust, to confirm that alibi, no one else. And they didn't check the visitor's log at the nursing home or talk with Kyler's great aunt. 
Kyler also said he practiced with his band at a friend's house that day. And one more allegation addressed in pretrial court filings. The defense discovered police gathered cell phone location data from Kyler's phone for other dates in May 2007. But data for May 4th, the day Cara disappeared, is missing. The devil is in the details, so to speak. John Paserno is a Kansas City criminal defense attorney who is not affiliated with the case. However, he did tell 41 Action News in this upcoming trial, the defense will likely attack how police investigated this case. From what I've read and even from the state's responses, uh, the investigation is less than what I'm sure the prosecutors would have liked for it to have been. Kyler Youth's attorneys allege police ignored other possible suspects. In fact, police questioned another person, but no notes of that interview can be found. A recording of that interview was eventually discovered in a police department desk drawer in 2020, after the Belton detective in the case retired. And in an unusual twist, in April 2017, Kyler Eust's half-brother, Jessup Carter, was charged with resisting arrest during a traffic stop that occurred the same day police found Jessica Runyon's burned SUV. In the back seat of his vehicle at the time, Kyler Eust. Kyler wasn't taken into custody, though, at that time because a warrant had not yet been issued for his arrest. We just want Cara and Jessica, we want those families to have some justice served. And if he's found to be guilty, you know, uh, we just want, we want them to be, uh, we just want them to feel better at night that he's finally been away, you know, and I'm not okay and my family's not okay with anything that he did. The next year, Jessup was also charged with arson for setting fire to his uncle's house at 59th in Manchester, a location that could have ties to the case as the defense alleges it may have been a crime scene. But if Jessup knew anything about Jessica or Kara's deaths or the alleged cover-up of the crimes, jurors won't hear his testimony. While in custody at the Jackson County Detention Center in September of 2018, Jessup somehow covered a cell camera and then hanged himself. A notebook and suicide note found in his jail cell were not collected and saved. The defense team also alleges a Kansas City police officer, Joshua Meyerer, conducted his own investigation, which included interviewing witnesses, despite being told more than once not to work the case. Their concern? That his contact with witnesses tainted the witnesses' statements. The state maintains, though, that Meyerer didn't speak with any witnesses who hadn't already been interviewed by Belton Police or the FBI. Still, in court documents filed months later, the defense states a Kansas City police detective illegally tracked Eust with an electronic device that was obtained without a warrant. 41 Action News reached out to KCPD. A spokesperson provided a statement that reads, quote, We generally do not comment on pending litigation, which this matter is, to ensure fairness for all sides in the matter, end quote. The judge in the case denied the defense's motion to dismiss the charges. As to whether all of this is enough to distract a jury? If they know someone is guilty, based on, you know, these one, two, three, or four things that they're going to all of a sudden just let this person go free because the law enforcement didn't do a good job. On the other hand, if it's a close call and they're thinking up there while they're deliberating, you know, if law enforcement had done A, B, and C, we'd know the answer to this question. And if we knew the answer to this question, we'd know whether or not, you know, we could find him guilty. While the facts of this case will be laid out in court, it's important to remember that at the heart of this trial, there are two families who've experienced heartbreak that's hard for most of us to comprehend. Jessica's favorite color is teal and Cara's is purple. The families of Cara Kopetsky and Jessica Runyon's will forever be linked due to tragedy. Sadly, there are other families who have also experienced this type of grief. Connie Sheely is the board president for Parents of Murdered Children, a national organization. While Sheely doesn't know Cara and Jessica's families personally, she does know the grief they feel and the trepidation they're likely experiencing as they prepare to face the man they believe killed their daughters. Still, she says being a part of the court process is important and can help to finally bring families a sense of closure. Our loved ones cannot go there, cannot attend, cannot speak for themselves. So as survivors and family members and friends, that's our job to speak for them. Her advice to the families, lean on loved ones, remember why you're there, and focus on all the positive memories of both young ladies. I love you, Jessica, that will never change. And until we meet again, fly high, you sweet angel. This isn't goodbye, it's simply an I'll see you later. 
she was robbed of, of her life. And, you know, she deserves justice. And, and, you know, it's up to us now to make sure that she gets that justice. Justice these two families hope they will see soon. Opening statements are set for Monday, April 5th. 41 Action News is committed to bringing you full coverage of this trial. From crews who will be stationed at the Cass County Courthouse to expert analysis on each day's testimony. We will also be bringing you updates on all of our streaming platforms, including a special webpage you can find at kshb.com slash Kyler Used. From all of us here at 41 Action News, thanks for joining us.